whether you're ready to yeah okay so 13th is um the next novel in the pagamon c loose series world i guess um it's lovecraftian horror meets kitchen sink drama <laughs> in a darkly funny kind of a way um so i'll read you the blurb um, so you know what to expect and then i'll give you the content warnings for the particular sections that i'm going to read um, so Katie Porter is the 13th child of a 13th child uh, in an inbred family of eldritch horrors. And I can't read it because it's got the <laughs> not the resale banner across the back, which I hadn't figured out just a second, guys. Oh, God. You can pause the recording, Sam, if you want, just for a sec. I'll do it now. Katie Porter is the 13th child of a 13th child in an inbred family of eldritch horrors, and her own eventual metamorphosis will change her into a creature that hungers for her family's flesh. To some, she's a threat, to others, a weapon. Katie needs allies to help her control her changes, but she's stuck with her oldest brother, a drug-addled playboy who voted to have her killed, but is chaotic enough to have genuinely changed his mind, and her eyeball-eating godlike cousin, whose idea of protecting her involves abduction, dark rituals, and encouraging her homicidal side. If anyone is going to survive Katie's transformation, scores need to be settled and fears need to be faced, and Katie is not the only one who needs to face them. So. Uh, it's definitely adult, it's not YA, uh, Katie is 17, but um, the other two main characters are 29. Um, you missed Ricky's birthday, sorry guys, uh, that was in September, he's a Virgo. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to read two memories. Um, so the book has got 13 chapters, and um, I can talk about how it's structured and stuff later. For this one, Ricky is a soothsayer, so you've got some uh, animal cruelty in the form of reading entrails, um, in particular birds. Uh, strong language throughout um, and general horror vibes. Um, so, yeah, uh, enjoy. So this is... Um, Ricky in October, so this is the October after the crows is finished, if you've read that, so we're just a place you want a timeline. Um, if you haven't, don't worry, uh, you could read the crows as a prequel and read 13 first, um, some people have done that and say that's fine. Ricky sat alone in the coal cellar at Fairwood House, deep in contemplation. Around him, dead birds were arranged in a rough pattern in various stages of death and decay, their entrails spilling onto the candlelit floor. One was still twitching, clinging grimly to life with every ounce of fight it had, but as he watched, the light winked out of its bright, agonised eye, and it twitched once more and lay still. Interesting. He allowed himself a slow yawn and a stretch, unsure of the time. Maggots danced inside a magpie to his left. He nodded at it, poring over the putrefaction. His jaw fluttered. Merlin Silvestris could prophesy accurately without reading the dead. He had read about it before. He'd thought that with his beauty now fully revealed, his glory fully manifested, that the secrets of the cosmos would fall into place before his eyes, regardless of which form he was in. Yet here he was, a few months on, and he was still rooting about in corpses and couldn't see his own future. The forbidden desire hadn't gone away either. He tried not to think about it, but poking at the ruined bodies only made it starker, mocking him. He could see any number of things in his beautiful form, feed upon the energies of lesser things, open his third eye and bask in the wonders of what was yet to come. But he still couldn't change it. The dance of the birds in the sky on previous evenings had told him he wasn't going to be the sole master of Fairwood House for long. All right, Lodger, she didn't like it when he used the M word. He killed a few to make sure, finding satisfaction in their decay, but the entrails told him the same thing. She'd find others to fill her rooms. A house like this couldn't be content with only one inhabitant. It wasn't what she was built for. He couldn't blame her for that. He picked up the freshly dead sparrow, still at last, its final shudders only underlining what everything else had revealed. It wasn't often he lost his temper, but its beak was gaping in a mocking laugh and he couldn't stand it. 
He clenched his fist, squeezing until the sinews stood out on his forearms, until he felt the small bag of flesh and bones burst and crack and ooze between his fingers. The coal cellar watched, that vengeful part of her she kept under lock and key, and he fueled her thirst. Why are you angry? He grinned in the flickering dark. Shouldn't I be? You said I'd be your lodger, your only one. That's not what these say. We're going to have guests. When did I promise you that? We don't need anyone else. I'm all you need. I can repair you. I can take care of you. I can... He felt the smouldering bitterness of Fairwood's bad memories pushing at him from the walls as the bird blood drained into her foundations. She sucked it up like milk. Good old girl, I'll help you feel better. None else can give you revenge like me. I don't need revenge now, Fairwood whispered. He stroked the floor, smiling crookedly at the flagstones. Out loud, he said, you should have seen all their faces when I changed in front of them, the family, I mean. They think I'm a god. What are the eyeballs for? The voice tickled the back of his brain, whispering gently. He glanced around at the mason jars on shelves above his taxidermy kit. Insurance. I'm learning what to do with them. And you really think I'd bring guests in here? She sen he sensed this was meant to be a joke, but he was on the defensive. It's tidy, ain't it? The whole cellar seemed to sigh. There's no need to be so upset. You of all people should know the future isn't a straight line. He blocked her out of his head. He'd rather burn her to the ground himself than be just another lodger, a guest, lost in the crowd. Bird remained squidged around his flexing fingers. The little broken body flopped wetly onto the floor. I ain't jealous. Jealousy's beneath me. That was almost his grandmother's voice, the mantra deeply ingrained. He sniffed at his hand, inhaling the stink of blood and the contents of the burst digestive system and wiped it off in a ragged hand towel. He blew the candles out and kicked the maggot-filled birds out of his way as he headed to the steps. <laughs> Thank you for that reading. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, so obviously there's some characters there that we've met before in The Crows. Um, I'm sort of interested about where you think people coming into your world for the first time, will they be able to orientate themselves quite well in this story, do you think? Um, or do you officially recommend reading The Crows first? Uh, I, I gave it to several people who had not read The Crows and I did that on purpose to see if they got it. And they did. Um, and all of them said that they wanted to read The Crows as a prequel because Ricky was one of the characters they were really interested in. Um, I think that um, it would be, so, so I deliberately tried to write it so that you could orientate yourself reasonably well, um, but I haven't explained that whole backstory or the, because that's another novel. So um, I think you can do it either way. I think I'd recommend reading The Crows first, just if you're the kind of person that wants that linear narrative, mm. that would make more sense. Um, but it is possible if you, if you, I think, you know, if you didn't realize it was a, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's definitely possible to read it as a prequel um, and read 13th first, but yeah. So, Obviously, it's, it's a sequel and you've got characters going on like Fairwood, um, as she's called there, and Ricky, obviously, as well. Um, yeah. and I'm wondering, sort of, uh, you know, were you, do, do you see this as sort of like uh, continuing their story in a sense from the first book, or are you stepping sideways and exploring the world in different ways? And what was that like? Oh, God, both. Um... So it's very difficult to tell this story because um, so much happens in the cross, <laughs> um, and yet nothing very much happens in the cross. <laughs> um, so you've got, um, I don't really do plot driven novels. I like to follow a character arc because that's more interesting to me. So the problem is um, I'm stepping sideways into the family uh, Ricky's family as a whole. So there are several branches of the one family 
and they're all inbred and they're all monstrous and they're all sort of um, you know um, and they have different family names but they're all interconnected and interrelated so the branch we're looking at is the porters um, and the particular branch of the porters because you figure that they are quite a big family um, has um, a family tree for you and that's in the novel so that's in the ebook and the paperback so you can kind of orientate yourself as to where you're looking uh, uh so what you're looking at and which group you're talking about um i say family tree it's a bit more like a rhombus but um they <laughs> um yeah uh but they all have different kind of eldritch things going on um, and I wanted to explore that family more and the specific family dynamics. So you get to see Ricky from a very different perspective. So from the crows, you see Ricky from Carrie's perspective, who is the owner of the crows. Uh, the crows is the nickname given to Fairwood House. Um, so you see him purely from that outside view. In 13th, you see Ricky the way that everybody else in his family sees him. And in particular, two members of his family who just think he's a dick. Um, so you get this whole build up of um, he's set up to be very much an eldritch god kind of character. Um, but that's not the way that his cousins see him because they've grown up with him and he's a prick. So and it is literally like that cousin that you don't really like to talk to has suddenly like become something great. And you're like. No. Nah. <laughs> so, and that's that's the dynamic. So, um, you do get to see. Um, Ricky has a point of view, um, so you do get to see stuff from from his point of view, and you do get that kind of continuation of eight months on from where the crows left off, and how he's changed as a person, and how that has affected him as a person. Um, but also, you have other things going on that are also kind of impacting uh, his character. And it's there are different three different strands. There's um, Ricky, Katie, and Wes. So yeah, bit of both. Where did, where did the idea of this interconnected incestuous cannibal eldritch god family come from, Mel? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, um, I don't know really, it's just, uh, it, it just sort of happened and it's just, a, it's a very natural, <laughs> it's a very natural way for me to explore like family dynamics um, because I like the, <laughs> families are really complicated and I like pushing things beyond the reasonable limits of, of where things should be pushed. Um, so if I'm dealing with um, a family that, you know, the issues of, of, that could just be metaphorical um, and you have this sort of cycles of toxicity and emotional and psychological trauma and abuse going on within a particular group um, and also things like um the fact that they ought to be eldritch gods that are kind of you know taking over the world and they're not because what they actually worship is being middle class um and it just seemed really natural then to have them as this kind of really inward looking inward focused family that are constantly trying to do one over on each other and are actually actively eating each other as <laughs> in their scramble to become more and more bourgeois um because cosmic horror isn't is too wide for me it's too big of a plot um so what i quite like um just because i find it funny is um the anticlimactic sort of very small scale things of people actively going well, yeah, I mean, I could do something dramatic, but um, that's boring and pointless. Whereas this really minor thing, that's actually very important. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I just, yeah, and I feel like that's, a, it's a bit of catharsis and it's a bit of, <laughs> yeah. 
it's a bit of um i guess social commentary i don't know like <laughs> There's a few things that come up out of that, um, <laughs> but like one of them is I know that you kind of work a lot with and think a lot about class. Would you say that's kind of one of the things that you're really focusing on exploring with the text and uh, sort of how does that erupt into the text in some fun ways, maybe? Yes. Um, yes. I. I <laughs> Class is something I'm really interested in, in terms of how um, social mobility works and as social aspirations work. Um, so the crows, um, I'll have to talk a bit about the crows because that's um, the classic um, bit of a working class character ending up within an elite space. Um, and what happens to you um when you know you you enter a space that you shouldn't be in um or like that wasn't built for you let's say um so fairwood house aka the crows which is what the locals call it um is uh there's a reason why carrie um when she buys it a lot of the scenes take place in the kitchen and that's the same is true for 13th um, because the kitchen is the below stairs working class space within the um, within the big the big house, you know. Um, and so that's where all the characters end up, and that's kind of where they're most comfortable. Um, the Carrie's bedroom is not a master bedroom; it's um, one of the guest rooms because she feels more comfortable in a smaller room. And because the personality of the master bedroom um, doesn't like her being there. Um, and she just ends up being more comfortable in, in a different room. And so that the idea is that the house itself has different personalities and different rooms and different rooms have witnessed different things or have had different things happen in them. And um, so it's not really a cohesive personality until it ends up with a manifested avatar of the house that um, so, so that's something that gets played with. Um, it, yeah, so, <laughs> so, um, if that's confusing, I, I apologize, should just read the book. Uh, <laughs> but the house, yeah, is, is, a, is, a, is a character all of its own. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that. Um, and yeah there's a lot within the within sort of ricky's family which is the main thing in 13th um you see how the different uh members of the family or different branches of the family respond to each other and it's based on social status and it's based on aspiration and it's based on um the markers of class and it's the performative outward markers of class um, which is why, even though Ricky is actually an eldritch god, um, his cousins still think he's a prick. And they don't take him seriously, even though he could actually tear them apart and eat them, um, because he still wears a tracksuit and he's basically a chav. And like, that's not going to change, why would it? And he lives in a cottage in the woods with like no central heating because his parents don't didn't think that was important <laughs> like <laughs> so it's just really embarrassing to to those to to people who do so he gets overlooked in terms of they just take what they want from him um but they don't take him seriously as a person because he doesn't appreciate the things that they appreciate and you've got this sort of really weird yeah thing going on that's fine. One of my favorite uh, quotes is obviously. Yeah, that's kind of how it. That's, yeah, that's how it goes. Is that kind of the Chappy Hannibal Lecter thing? Is that something that you deliberately kind of you started off with the idea of wanting to have a Hannibal Lecter character and deconstruct that? I guess if that's not quite the right word, but make it chappy. I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, like. <laughs> Um, yeah, like uh, I wanted, I wanted it to be 
a really kind I, I don't know what I was I don't know I don't know what I was going for I just had this I just wanted somebody who just like just hung out in the woods and you would recognize him mm -hmm. I I wanted like I wanted a character that you uh you could kind of recognize in terms of um physicality and in terms of like if if you if you've been to any given small town you've probably met someone who reminds you of Ricky Porter <laughs> like I used to hang out with a lot, a lot of my friends actually <laughs> and the idea was that if you know if you transplant this lad um out of his toxic family and into a slightly better more supportive one you're probably all right hmm. Because it's not the fact, I mean, you know, it's not the fact that he's a monster. It's the fact that he's grown up in a very particular way and has had a lot of things done to him. <laughs> and then he's just kind of, he's also quite amoral and he's also, but he could be, he, yeah, there's a potential that he, you can kind of see that, that that's not a necessary thing for his personality, mm -hmm. actually. But yeah, I and I, I just kind of liked that accessibility of the Hannibal Lecter character. You know, like he's not he's not a psychologist. He's not very well educated. He's not educated. He's self educated. Um, he didn't go to school, um, and he's just very much. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't value education. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got like those sorts of all those sorts of things going on. Um, but he also eats people. Yeah. Yeah it's not personal I think one of the things we obviously found the weirdest when we read The Crows and I'm presuming the same potentially continues in 13th is how much everybody loved Ricky Porter despite the tentacles and the cannibalism and everything yeah weird <laughs> <laughs> is that is that still a vibe in 13th or do you start to side with Wes and Katie and think he's a bit of a prick I really like Wes mm. a lot Wes is a, Wes is a dick <laughs> um, in many many ways but he tries but I I he's grown on me as a character yeah <laughs> Caleb's was um he's very he yeah you can't really he's completely the opposite to Ricky in so many ways and he has very different priorities and he's very self-destructive and very traumatized <laughs> um but I really like it. I really like Wes as a character and Katie I really like as a character as well um that was it it was interesting writing her as just this again very kind of um yeah <laughs> very uh just a yeah traumatized and neglected teenager um who knows that she's going to grow up to kill most of her family what and is dealing with that great <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean we've we've sort of drifted into the territory of thinking about other characters so perhaps i will lead us on to hand it back over to email for the second reading perhaps would that work for you yeah i'm gonna do a wes reading and I might have to explain, does anyone, does anyone remember? So this is kind of set, this is Wes's memory of his change when he was 18. So this is like, uh, he's born in 1990, so 18, what's that, 20, 20, can someone do the maths? 2008. 2008, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> um, so it's set in 2008 when, um, does anyone remember or know what the term metrosexual was? Yeah, okay. Um, so <laughs> yeah. So Wes um, at this time in his life is, um, is <laughs> it's very much like that. <laughs> um, it's, um, but yeah, he's also pan omnisexual, maybe um, one of those. Um, and he's kind of just getting into learning about himself and stuff. But that he's <laughs> this is the point at which he is going through what the family call the changes, which is where they are they are human passing. Um, 
they can pass for humans, but they change around about 18 to 21 um, and they get their eldritch mutation um, through a process of ritual. And it's, it's Wes's turn. Um, so this is um, his, I'm, right, okay, extremely strong language <laughs> in this one. Um, but I'll cut it before Wes calls Ricky the C word. <laughs> Shall I just just to spare everybody's uh, sensibilities on the recording? Um, okay. Everyone had breathed a sigh of relief when Charlotte Porter, a single birth and a thirteenth child, had given birth to a single son. Her older sister Letitia, pregnant with a batch, had been delighted for her. Single births were special. Then, of course, three months later, Letitia's batch was spawned, except it wasn't a batch at all, it was one boy, and then Charlotte had spawned again. Everyone thought Wes, as a single birth, would get some measure of the soothsaying powers Pendle-only children tended to get, but that honour was his solitary cousins alone. Small comfort for Auntie Letty and Uncle George, who had always wanted a big family. It was decided that Wes's single birth was an accident of nature, a disappointment and nothing more. When it came closer to the time of changing, he'd avoided going to the shrine to ask for special consideration. That wasn't cool. But when it was finally his turn, he descended the cellar steps in full stupid regalia anyway. At least he would thought it was stupid when everyone else wore it. The wool itched and the robe was too short on him, but that meant he wouldn't fall flat on his face or fuck it up with clumsiness. Tonight, his night, he wore it with a strange, unfamiliar sense of pride. He was special. He was going to change, the first of his siblings to do it, but his cousin had gone first. Ricky was there, three months changed and three months sober, pupils the right size, not drawing attention to himself. He'd finally been read the riot act. Wes was hemmed in by relatives and their robed forms, humming low and muttering a chant Gran claimed she had heard emanating from the outside. He was blindfolded, Gran tying the wide woolen scarf tight behind his head, nearly catching his hair. They slipped a hood over his head for good measure, the robe supposed to cover everything else and keep it hidden until the big reveal at the end. They marched him around Gran's garden, the chanting gathering momentum as he lost track of who was who and who was where, he could tell at first by their voices, but then they all merged into one. It was like labour pains, some said. You felt them where the changes would happen, usually in your head, your throat, your chest. Some had it all over. Some described it like needles, others like knives. His mother said hers had been like contractions, but in her spine. Wes had been feeling an odd numbness all over, creeping across his skin and eating into his larynx for three weeks. Gran said it was coming, they couldn't delay any more. But there wasn't any pain. He thought it always came with pain. I don't think it's the changes, he'd said, but was overruled when Gran examined him properly. Wes wasn't ready. He liked his face, his pretty boy face. Didn't give a toss that the lad said he was metrosexual. He bought into it with skincare and hair gel, wasn't ready for extra appendages and gelatinous ooze. They pushed him through the back door into the kitchen. He worried about leaving traces of mud on Gran's kitchen floor, stomach cold and somersaulting with each shove, each step forwards. He tried to picture the room, arms raised slightly to feel his way across to the cellar, but he was hemmed in by relatives in front and behind, someone at each elbow, too many for the tight space. How were they all fitting in? Someone was manipulating reality again. Nothing was where it ought to be. The tiles crunched under his soles like sand. He breathed through the scarf, inhaling the heat of a volcanic desert. There were steps. Someone took his hands. Wes descended, the darkness total. Now there was a humming, the tug in his chest, irresistible, physical, like a meat hook on a reeled-in string. It was starting to hurt, a strange ache all over. Could skin ache? Was it muscle deep? Bone deep? He didn't know. Something was sucking at his face, like he'd stepped in front of a vacuum cleaner. The suction pulled him faster down the steps and he nearly tripped. When he recoiled, it felt like some invisible force was ripping his face off. Wes stumbled, trying to press his hands to his hood, hold his skin on, but he was pulled and grabbed by so many hands and thrown down to the cellar floor. Wes landed with a hard thud on his hands and knees, not on the flagstones, 
but on hard grit baked by a sudden that wasn't theirs. He dug his long fingers deep into it, let it trickle through them, the heat on his back. His ears rang, but there was nothing to hear but the hum and the chant far away. He was alone. He stood up, knowing he mustn't take his hood off, mustn't take the blindfold off, mustn't look. Sweat prickled all over, beading against the itchy wool, sliding down his back, his face, his chest. Where was he? Where was everyone? He was not alone. Welcome, Wesley. He stood still, petrified, the voice worming into his mind. Take off the blindfold. Obedience was mandatory, he couldn't help it. First the hood, he fumbled for it, tugging it off, an old sack without eye holes, scratchy under his trembling hands. Then the scarf. I want to be me, he thought, fingers tugging helplessly at the knot. Please let me still be me. The sacrifice has been made. What sacrifice? By whom? He hadn't made one. He was beginning to regret that now, but it was too late. We have heard the request on your behalf and we have something special for you. There was a presence directly in front of him. He could feel it there looming, blocking the dim light source that penetrated the scarf fibers. He screwed his eyes shut as he finally worked the scarf loose and pulled it down around his neck. Whatever it was, it was gigantic. He could sense it surrounding him, feel its shadow moving across his body, hear its breath or whatever it was doing, like a throbbing song without a tune. Please let me be me, he thought. I want to be me. Open your eyes, Wesley. And Wes would always remember nothing from that moment on, not even in his nightmares, for when he opened his eyes, there was nothing but darkness and the darkness looked back. When he came to, he was on his back in the cellar, Staring up at the ceiling, the family gathered around, staring at him with baffled intensity. Is that it? Someone de demanded, disappointed. Shit me, Wes heard Uncle George say, emaciated from his most recent bout of illness and leaning against the wall. Where'd he go? Wes turned his head, and there was a muffled hiss of consternation, then some sniggers. What did he used to look like? His mother asked someone else. His, his chest cinched. He jerked upright, stumbling and tearing off the woolen robe. His face felt the same, but then he took his hands away and forgot. Wait, was it the same? What had it been like before? It ought to have a nose. Yes, there was one still there. Was it the same shape? And the eyes? Yes, two. That was right, wasn't it? Everyone had two eyes. Most people, anyway. All right, most people who weren't Wens. Lips? Yes, only one mouth. And his nose? What about that? Yes, a nose. How many eyes? Two. Ears? Nose? Chin? Eyes? I need a mirror, he croaked, struggling to breathe. Don't panic. His voice sounded... Wait, what did his voice sound like? They remembered what he'd said, though, because his mother was delving into her ceremonial robes and pulling out her compact. Was it his normal voice? What had he sounded like before? He looked into the mirror with a burst of relief as a normal face looked back at him. He blinked, lowering the compact, and erased it from his memory. Wait, wait, what did he look like? Was he normal? He couldn't remember what he'd looked like before. Surely there were photographs he could check against those. He stared back into the mirror, fixing everything in his mind, seeing the face in it for the very first time. It was a face he could work with. Fine, he blinked. Who was that in the mirror? Shit, Jesus, it was him. Almost as good as the invisible man, Uncle David boomed into the thick, warm closeness of the overcrowded room and broke the tension. Everyone started to laugh. Someone clapped him on the back and Wes tilted the mirror accidentally, erasing the memory of his own image again. Wait, his mother took the compact back and Wes tried to stop her, but they were jostling him, all wanting to congratulate him on his change, see what else he'd got. Wait. They were grabbing at his arms, his legs, cuffing his head to see if there was a second mouth like Cousin Ricky, digging him in the ribs to see if he was like Cousin Seth, grabbing his chin and showing him off to each other with leering grins. Now you see him, now you don't, Ricky said from his corner, out of the way of everyone else, lounging back with a nasty gleam in his eyes. Wes didn't trust that grin. What did you do? He demanded as he was shoved back towards the stairs. You fucking did something. What did you do? 
Someone had made a sacrifice on his behalf, asked for something special. Someone had robbed him of his own face. Where's his insides trickled away, squirming coldly. You did this! Ricky shrugged, ducking his head to keep Wares in sight as the relatives st started up the customary post-ceremony drinking song. Agent of fate me, I don't do nothing. You're a fucking liar, Wares yelled and his voice whirled away, drowned out. That ain't the whole truth. What did you see? What did you say? What the fuck have you done to me? Have a nice life, Wesley, Ricky yelled over the racket. He waved his hand in front of his own face. Enjoy the, <laughs> you know. And that is when. <laughs> I feel that was provocation enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wes loses it a little bit. <laughs> Fair. More. Um, so this last session, uh, guys, this last section, we have open to questions from everybody. So um, just so I can keep a track, um, pop a question in the in the chat or pop your hand up so that I can see. Um, I can see who's asking questions just so I can follow. But yes, what questions do people have? I'm just looking at the chat. Oh yeah, I, I, um, I've I serialized the prose on my podcast. So if anyone wants to hear me read it chapter by chapter, <laughs> um, they're about 30 minutes long episodes. I've tried to cut it. So we're up on uh, chapter 11 at the moment. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the law of ricky somehow every time he does something terrible you're just like oh i like him more somehow oh what a scamp <laughs> yeah. yes <laughs> wildest dreams speak. how do you mean uh, like um like um I don't know uh, what you mean. Like, I'd like to see it televised. Is that the kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, that would be that be terrifying. But I watched that on a Saturday night, just like <laughs> I don't know, like off the back of Misfits or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit like being human, but um, yeah, like very. Eldritchy, more cannibals, more cannibals. Yeah, yeah. You you'd have to you'd have to pixelate his face out when you're not looking at him. I've thought about this. So you'd have to. <laughs> so like, if he's in the background of a scene or like something, as soon as the camera is not on him, you'd have to pixelate out his face. I think, mm -hmm. or just because I think if you just had it blurred the whole time, it would be like seizure inducing which actually happens at one point in 13 <laughs> but what is um oh i don't i don't have a dream cast honestly um i i really don't like i, I don't know if anyone's seen brassic but like um it's a sky original so i think if you don't have sky it's like but it's um it's with um Michelle Keegan and Joe, what's his name? Also in Misfits, played Rudy Gilgum. Is that a word? Is that a name? I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, something like that <laughs> would be really good. Like, just, I think it would have to be like working class characters being played by people who could do actual accents and didn't sound posh. Yeah. Middleston <laughs> is Ricky or something, and it'd just be like, no, God, <laughs> he's five foot five. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't have that. It's got... Yeah, he's like a really short Tom Hardy, I suppose. <laughs> Maybe not quite as good looking as Tom Hardy, but I don't know. Like Ali for that one, like. Yeah, Tom Hardy is actually short. Is he? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> there we go. Ooh, yes. Frank. Frank question. Oh. 
Uh, I never know. I mean, the whole point of Pagamon Sea is that loads of stuff is happening that I just have to go and find out about. Like it's a whole town. Um, <laughs> um, I'm hoping to do to go back in time with it a bit and do my uh, 1920s and 1940s um, kind of stories that I, I'm going to explore the um, Eglantine Pritchard angle, who's the hedge witch that put a curse on Fairwood House um, and Ricky's family in particular uh, are kind of, you, you know, set her up as a nemesis of theirs. Um, and that's not strictly speaking true. It's a lot more complicated and her relationship with that family is a lot more complicated than that. Um, and I kind of like the idea of having a bit more to explore um, around that as a kind of historical fiction backstory type thing. Um, so she's there with her, she, she's uh, so they, uh, her life partner, Gwen, uh, they got together in boarding school um, in Wales. And <laughs> so they're just uh, middle-aged lesbians just hanging out in a little cottage. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, being troublemakers. And I, I quite like that. Um, so I kind of want to write that as a, um, you know, 1940s um, thing, uh, just just for that kind of fun times with the vacuums and um, interesting social dynamics and the home front and that sort of thing, um, just for fun, really. Um, yeah, uh, but I, I, I am going to go and do another one going forwards but I have shot myself in the foot because um, even though I don't put the year um, so the crows is kind of 2018 and this is 2019 <laughs> so I've done that terrible thing of writing contemporary fiction where the next one I have to do something really interesting with uh, just like Ricky in lockdown is going to be interesting um, and I have started writing that as fun. Um, so I, I might I might play with that a little bit more. That just amused me. Um, but yeah, so so many different things. Um, I've got a full draft of a werewolf story, but I need to go back and fix it by rewriting it completely. Um, <laughs> so you might get Barker Crescent, um, which is an area of the town that's um, that's sort of the lycanthropic area. And we might explore that a bit more. Um, and I wanna do some stuff with the undead as well. Um, the undead community of Pagamon Sea. So yeah, so there's loads of stuff um, at the moment. And what I'm doing at the moment is exploring it in the podcast um, by getting random people to create original characters for me. And then we we role play it and I interview them as me, but as like the persona of me. Mm -hmm. um, and we pretend Pagamonsi is a real place. And so I did that with um, my husband <laughs> who, <laughs> who plays Guillaume Veld in um, one of the bonus episodes that just come up um, on the podcast. Um, and he's a traveling researcher, so we get to explore a little bit more. And I might set some, we're, we're co writing some short stories kind of based on his um, concepts uh, and our concepts uh, for that. Um, yeah, so, so um, lots of things. And I'm doing one for May, no, for, for June. Um, and I'm interviewing a medium who um, has fallen in love with a face in a wall that's kind of like a fungal supernatural entity. Um, so that's being played by um, Fiona Murphy and Rob Alexander, who are um, friends of mine. <laughs> I just roped into this madness. And I've no, and the fun thing is for me that I have absolutely no idea um, what they're going to say because it's not, um, and of course there's Eldritch Girls, which is, um, not to be confused with the title of the podcast. Um, so there's a book called Eldritch Girls Just Want to Have Fun, which is set early 2016 in Brighton with one scene in Pagamon Sea. And that's co-written with uh, Nita Pan, who's waving. 
<laughs> um, and uh, that is a romantic slasher um, between a hitman from Chicago, written and created by Nita, um, and Sasha Shaw, who is a member of that family. Um, and uh, she's starring in snuff films, and he's collecting people to be in the snuff films, to be snuffed in the snuff films, <laughs> in fact. Um, so it's kind of like if, I don't know, like um, Tarantino and Rob Zombie wrote a rom-com. Um, and we're trying to get like as many romantic tropes in there as possible, but with chainsaws. Excellent. Yeah. And Casablanca scene at Southampton Airport, which I'm really looking forward to writing. <laughs> Just in the car park. <laughs> so yeah, so that's going to be funny and very gory and smutty and um, yeah, just blood and sex and gratuitous violence. There's a couple of questions in the chat, Mel. Um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of scrolled up, but Amanda had one um, right. that both novels slot together so well but still managed to have quite different feels did you find your writing process or inspirations differed much this time around <laughs> this time around i had no clue what i was doing so I was <laughs> uh yeah so this time around i wrote um i had something to go on the first time and i kind of rewrote a random first pants first draft that i didn't uh sent it out to beaters and then i changed the ending uh because it didn't really work out the way that I wanted it to. Um, so I did that. And this time around, I did a lot more exploratory writing. Mm. And I had a lot more, uh, so many scenes that never, that, you know, the plot ended up taking a different direction and the pacing didn't work. Um, and I, this one was much more of um, a Frankenstein's creature story in the sense, in a way that I constructed it, because it literally was, I would put it together and go, oh no, now it's got three legs, that don't work. Rip that off, start again. Mm. Um, and it, it, it was, yeah, so I gutted it twice um, and tried to uh, move, move scenes around. So it was very much more of a jigsaw, this one, than a, a linear narrative, mm. but yeah. We've got a really big question from Linz. I don't know if you can see it that they're going to save most of their questions for the book group. But for now, they want to know, does Pagamon Sea have a decent fish and chip shop and who runs it? And there's a follow up question from Tabata about whether it's actual fish or if it's an eldritch creature or bits of one. All right. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so there's uh, a load of fish bars in Pagamon Sea because it's a seaside town. I would recommend um, <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> Um, there's a couple I would recommend uh, that, you know, if you get a, a flyer through, um, there's Big Fish, that's a good one. Um, that's actual cod and hake, but it's, it's uh, yeah, that's got some good reviews. Um, very generous portions. Uh, <laughs> they know how to cook a chip there, so that's all good. Um, the one that, uh, the dodgy one, that's still quite good, but um, has is a bit controversial, doesn't have a very good hygiene rating. So there's that. Um, is, I uh, can't remember the name of it, I think it's the Red Lobster. Um, and as the name suggests, it doesn't just sell fish and chips. What it does sell um, is not necessarily just seafood, either well it is seafood but like um so, so there's a lot of hard shell i don't know if you know this but uh, this part of the, uh, the the bristol channel sometimes gets um some hard shell merfolk um what yeah, yeah uh and so their population is mysteriously not as not as big as it as it should be for certain times of the year um, so, but if you go to the Red Lobster, you might find out why. Um, it tastes a lot like hake, but but like hake crossed with crab. 
yeah um but i recommend that if you're if you're into something a little bit more interesting but do be aware of that food hygiene rating because it's not great um amanda has a question about some world <laughs> uh is that the carnival question yes so for those watching this as a video has Pagham ever gotten those summertime seaside carnivals and fun fairs and if so are they weird like the puppet shop or does everyone just get to have a nice time and if you want to know about the puppet shop mel does the reading for us on the channel so you can find it quite easily yeah. um so <laughs> uh yes you have the usual run of um like the, the normal kind of carnival circuit <laughs> circuit um so people do just have a nice time on the dodgems and like the little whirly go around things and yeah um that's all fine um there is there is an urban legend <laughs> about a particular um, <laughs> there's an urban legend about a particular carnival that comes around um every few years it's like every seven years or something and there's this there are lots of urban legends about it and it looks like a normal carnival and you just get the but it, they don't really advertise particularly well and um you get these sorts of flyers but you don't get them uh you get them on lamp posts rather than um you know on billboards or um on cork boards in different shops and things you only get these flyers on lamp posts and it's one of those things where you have to sort of rip off a ticket at the bottom so they don't sell tickets which is really weird um so you have to find the flyer and then you rip the thing off and it's a very kind of vintage carnival and it's got that kind of black and white a uh, uh, red and white sort of striped uh fun kind of look um and it's it's only open um at particular hours on particular days and then it just disappears um so um yeah lots of people lots of strange uh tales about that that carnival and people who narrowly escape some sort of a fate but what fate legends differ um the hall of mirrors in there is a particularly interesting one and there's uh there's lots of stuff about uh, potential um, mirror magic um, that I'm going to be looking at more with the uh, Eglantine Pritchard stories because her partner Gwen um, is possibly not entirely human and possibly very into mirror magic. Um, so you, you're going to get all of that kind of stuff. And that's also a link to uh, fairies um and portals and things like that so is it a fey carnival um that's one of the yeah that's one of the potential uh explanations of it this mysterious thing that pops up and disappears hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are ending uh we are rounding up to the end of the hour guys so does anyone have any last questions well we do have a break after this so if you have a last question we do have time to answer it don't worry oh did we miss a question from caro did we oh yeah going up how do you deal with the existence of prophecies and general second sight powers craft wise do you find them to be more useful fun or are they headache inducing Oh, they yeah. I avoid that by um, <laughs> by not really going into much detail. Um, so my my idea about prophecies is that it's very um, they're very much like Greek oracles. It's that kind of you you're given um, this is inevitably going to happen, but here is a really vague way. <laughs> like, and then you have to kind of figure out how it's going to happen is is not specified so technically there could be a number of loopholes so my idea is so wes's thing 
uh, so there are different conflicting things about um, Ricky's gift and the fact that he can look at the future and see it and then it, so he's always right um, and the family go well you can't do anything about it so that's just crap isn't it what's the point of that it's going to happen anyway what's the point of knowing what's going to happen you can't do anything about it except if you bet on it so the family use so Ricky has the power to see the outcomes of political events, the outcomes of world events, the outcomes of, and what the family use him for is the lottery numbers. Um, so that's, so he's got, there's a lot of background stuff I can do with Ricky. And there's a lot of stuff that I, I hint at in 13th as to where he's going as a character with his gift and that kind of thing and the development of that. Um, so we might get into, but, but one of the other strands of this is Ricky trying to figure out if prophecies are self-fulfilling or not mm -hmm. and how much of an agent of fate he is, which is his narrative, and how much of a tool of fate he is, which is what he doesn't want to be because he is viscerally opposed to being a tool of anybody or used by, but in fact is um, constantly. Um, where's his view of the future is that it's never fixed until you look at it. And it's the act of looking that solidifies what's going to happen. So if you don't look, then you can make your own fate. You can, you can control your own destiny. It's only when somebody looks at it and tells you that so it's Schrodinger's future, right? Um, it's only when you look at it and you, you can, that's when it all solidifies. So he is actually very opposed, ironically, to Ricky using his gift for anything other than something that's lucrative and that will benefit Wes. Um, and he thinks of it as an addiction and that looking at the future is addictive and it's also pointless and it's also dangerous and it messes up people's lives um, while he himself is hooked on various um, psychedelic drugs <laughs> that also like may or may not help him see the future. So like he's he has he has issues that he doesn't he doesn't really deal with but that's his but he likes to think that there is um a way to circumnavigate prophecies by just not just don't prophesy and then there isn't there isn't a problem <laughs> um so I'm, I'm going to kind of explore more of that um and show you how uh, maybe sort of through memories of how Ricky explored that as a teenager when he was getting to grips with his gift to begin with and that kind of thing um and then kind of leave it to to the reader I guess to decide what they think is going on if you can um as far as you can and let kind of just leave it as an op as open-ended as I can so that you can have all of these different interpretations sitting very uneasily beside each other um, so that there's still room for lots of different theories. Mm -hmm. so I find that it's, it's difficult to weave all of that in um, without being very info dumpy as well as in a, from a craft perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. So I had to cut a few things because I was like, mm, do something else with that later. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mel, for joining us. I'm just going to cunningly pop the link back to, to Mel's Kofi, where you can buy the crows, you can buy Pagamon Sea Folklore, you can buy short stories, you can buy the new book in uh, the ebook form. Yeah. And or you can just chuck a tip at Mel as well if yeah. you've enjoyed this session. Um not physically obviously um but hopefully also um if you have liked the sound of this um and you want to join us we will be reading 13th for book group so if you're like i want to talk to someone about it um and nobody else understands why you're reading a book about incestuous cannibals um because you have failed to uh explain why ricky porter is so amazing um then uh, we are doing a book group and you're very, very welcome to join us. So please do. The book group is, I'm just checking the date. Um, it's the 13th of May. So 13th of May, if you would like to come along, join us. It's going to be really fun. Um, apart from that, thank you to Mel and goodbye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye.